from the church of Stop Shopping. Please give a warm welcome to Reverend Billy. Amen, praise me. <laughs> One, I feel, I feel like I'm standing at the tributary of, of two streams that I've waded in with Jimmy in the front row here. The boots that could be used in a shallow river. I'm, I have been a green, certainly, and began fundraising performances for greens more than 10 years ago in uh, New York and ran for mayor of New York in, in 2009. And, uh, I remember we campaigned outside a lot when it became clear that we weren't invited into debates. So it became clear that we were marginalized structurally that there was a duopoly facing us. I get, I get people like Clyde Haberman on the phone, and he said, "Well, you know, I, I, just, I just I really want to talk to somebody who's going to win." So, but Clyde, <laughs> what about coming up with the right idea? <laughs> what about having a discussion, Clyde? Clip. And certainly Occupy uh, was anticipated by the kind of campaign we had. We, we performed on subways and fire escapes. All the ferries, all the, the radical ferries in the choir were on the Staten Island Ferry. Just want to work all the pun possibilities there for you. Because I know you're children of, of American advertising and you think in puns. Hallelujah, I want to be kind of a pop culture person here so that you understand. So the Occupy uh, and the Green traditions, two of my favorite churches. The initial idea of, of, of Reverend Billy was brought to me uh, by a gentleman who came to one of my plays. I was a playwright in, in California. And he, uh, he wanted to talk with me, he, wanted, he took me to lunch. And he had seen my plays, lived near the theater where I produced my plays in San Francisco. And he said that we, we need a, a new kind of American preacher. And he thought I was well cast in that role. It became clear that he was willing to teach me to be a preacher. That seemed anomalous to me. That seemed... First of all, I resisted. I came back at him and I said, you know what? I was raised by Dutch Calvinists in Western Michigan. I don't want to touch Christians. I don't want to touch Christians with a 20-foot pole. Thank you. Abused as a child in some sense. When you're seven years old and you look up at the Sunday school teacher and the Sunday school teacher says, you can go to hell for eternity based on an opinion that God the Father has about you and he may venture that opinion before you're born. And you're seven years old and you're looking up and, and into the eyes of that Sunday school teacher and you're just trying to make sense of it. You mean I can burn? You mean like when I put my hand on the stove only, only it's all over my entire body and then that goes on and it doesn't stop. And that could go on for just forever and ever. And it doesn't matter what I do. Hallelujah. <laughs> so I didn't want to, I didn't want to get involved with, with Christianity. He, he seduced me over, over a couple year period. He, was a, he had some money. He kind of hired me away from my theater job. He started taking me to uh, wild evangelical shamanistic whirlwind services 
where I, my liberal, sophisticated, overeducated snobbery was broken down, and I had to admit, as a, as a theater person, I had to admit that this, this was the best theater I ever experienced in my entire life. And this man, who was bringing me to these, you know, became my mentor, he said, Americans make their meaning out of Bible stories, even the secular ones. And he said, a lot of liberals don't know that, and he said, a lot of liberals, I don't blame them for resisting that notion. Because a lot of us find our personal meaning in flight from fundamentalism. Amen, praise be. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You discover yourself in flight from fundamentalism. So, he taught me to turn off the homophobic, warmongering stuff that was flowing out of the mouths of these preachers and to listen to the instrument of this, of this, of this American vocal form. Oh, children, when the vowels get really, really long and it's, it's talking and singing in combination. It's like the blues. And then once in a while, I'd, I'd, there'd, there'd be Jesse Jackson, a good preacher with good content as well. It does happen, children. We preach together... Zuccotti, boy, that was a thrill. That was a thrill for my choir. They couldn't believe their eyes. Bible stories. We, we, we have a tradition of the Old Testament stories, the New Testament stories. We have some of these stories are universal stories that, that actually are conglomerations of Egyptian and Greek mythology. Um, we land here and proceed towards the promised land. Uh, I don't know where that is anymore. Vietnam, the moon, I'm not sure where that is anymore. But we, we have a mission as Americans. And, and how hardwired those myths are in us is an interesting question. We eventually, eventually evolved, working with Sydney we eventually evolved the church of stop shopping. We decided that the ultimate fundamentalist devil in American society is shopping. And then we, st we started, as, as we went through time, uh, militarism and shopping kind of conflated. If you ever watched a football game and watch those ads that are video game, army recruiting football ads all at once, and amen, hallelujah. No wonder we went into Iraq purchasing a video game, amen. <laughs> sold to us by corporate marketers who were standing around George Bush in the Oval Office. Hallelujah, praise be, my God, the devil. So I've, I've, tried to, I've tried to go into the toxicity of our society. I've tried to not be afraid of, of, of like staring right at the butthole of Jimmy Swagger. And just... What, what evil do we have here? And how do we deal with it? We have right-wing apocalyptic preachers at various points in our, in our, in our history. I, I can see different ages here. It has seemed as if those right-wing apocalyptic preachers are running our foreign policy. Am I right? It has seemed at times as if they're running our domestic policy. Uh, the, 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 the impact they've had on the reproductive rights of women and, and on and on, same-sex marriage, on and on. Uh, we decided to go right at that and to blow it up. I've been involved in preach-offs, public preach-offs with right-wing preachers. And I hold, I, 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 I get them down and I, 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 I wrestle them <laughs> We preach and we preach and just when I know I can go in for the kill. And I said, who told you Jesus of Nazareth was ever a Christian? You made a mistake there. Well, down. That's where I pin them. Praise be. Amen. Now I'm upset. Now I'm pissed off. Children... The Occupy movement 
came into my life on September 17th, the first day that we were zigzagging through downtown Manhattan looking for Zuccotti Square. We knew it was there. We'd done some research. We knew that it was what they call a, uh, a privately owned public space, pops, which uh, they're all over Manhattan. And they are not defended because nobody thought of it. They're not defended legally. And we performed on on opening day, you might say, you might call it opening day <laughs> of our show. <laughs> Something happened at Zuccotti Square um, that 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 was much more powerful than my run for mayor. Uh, and I have studied it, regarded it, and finally I've been talking to people about my opinions of it that I've gathered by traveling around to 18 different Occupy communities. Um, St. Paul's Cathedral uh, in uh, London, Zurich, Barcelona, uh, uh, Portland, um, Oakland on one of the port closing days, uh, San Francisco, uh, Des Moines, uh, Kalamazoo, uh, am I pointing the right way? Which way, is, which way is the Midwest? I usually know where the Midwest is because I'm always trying to stay away from it. Uh, it's in Chicago, St. Louis. So, uh, something, that, something that we've agreed on that is coming, it's kind of coming backwards down into my work with my 35 voice choir and, and this barely controlled preacher character. Something happened there that made my, mo my, my most conservative Republican relatives have crises of conscience thousands of miles away. Anybody here have that experience? Really surprising invasions of well-defended right-wing minds thousands of miles away from Zuccotti Square, from something we were doing there. After decades of being accused of being <coughs> merely protesters, angry people with signs and rhyming chants. After decades of having the New York Times find a hippie grandmother to interview to represent all of us, uh, after, after decades of being made fun of by the media, by being accused of being 60s parodies by, by most of the mainstream media, suddenly, on that first day, it was clear there was a devastating protest form that we had discovered. And that is that we were living in public. We were trading food, stories, media, helping each other tie knots, laughing, singing, doing the things things that were supposed to be pixelated and cut into sections and labeled and disappeared into consumer society. We were doing it all without those divisions, without those shelvings, packagings, labelings, finance plans. <laughs> it was all there. You could live in Zuccotti Square, apparently. You could live there. <laughs> you didn't have to leave, necessarily. You could just live there. Something about that, in the shadow of the symbolic, you know, Chase Manhattan Plaza, blew people's minds. And when you think about it, we've never had change in this country without living in public. Back to the Revolutionary War, there was always living in public. There was always a hot plate. There was always sharing. There was always helping with each, other, each other's illnesses, with each other's moods taking care of each other's personalities, figuring out who was difficult. Nobody in this room is difficult, I can tell. You? <laughs> Middle class, well-educated, conditioned, Bergen County liberals. <laughs> now that's been methodically destroyed, that living thing's been methodically destroyed, but Bloomberg is not the brightest man in the world. Bloomberg blinked and let us stay there a few days. 
And when it was three days old, he had lost it. He had lost the battle. He completely lost the battle. Then his attempts to retake the square just became, you know, valiant, you know, Goya paintings. <laughs> Hallelujah. I learned a big lesson from Occupy, and I'm still learning it uh, here as we move towards May Day, and as the focus has a mysterious presence now in Union Square. So speaking of the Ethical Society, uh, we feel the presence now of Paul Robeson and Emma Goldman and Dorothy Day and Lucy Parsons and Norman Thomas and A.J. Musty, and we, we are feeling our history like an ethical society building. I perform in the London Ethical Society in Red Lion Square and the Central Park West. Uh, are, they, are they in the same? Are you somehow related to each other? Yeah. When you have ethical in the title? No, not necessarily. Huh? I saw ethical on the street outside. I saw a big sign. It's just the meeting house. Oh, I see. Do you pay them? Oh, that's good. This is a nice hall. The, the feeling of our ancestor activists, who were great, great preachers, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, you know, the rebel girl from Joe Hill's song, co-founder of ACLU. See those old pictures of Union Square? With the fedoras all the way to the buildings. Amen? With Emma Goldman up on the back of a, an old car or something. Shouting to... I don't, I don't see an ampl amplification there. If you, 19, 1907, the general strike, she's got all those young women from Eastern Europe, and, and she's shouting to them about, about reproductive rights more than a century ago. Uh, that's, that's a wonderful thing to come into the... Come into the I've, I've taken on the job now of being a teacher because, I, because of course, these, a lot of these 20-somethings from the Occupy movement uh, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily remember these things. Um, standing there, waiting for the news of Sacco Vanzetti, um, all the history of that place. The pavilion now, they're turning it into a restaurant. They privatized it. The, uh, the city's richest business improvement district uh, has private police, of course, the rent of cops, uh, moonlighting, some of the moonlighting real cops. Uh, hallelujah. The, the union, how did Union Square come into the Occupy sphere um, is a very interesting second development. And uh, we don't have to fetter, hey, Adam. We don't have to fetishize Zuccotti anymore quite so much. Although I, I as I as I as I went around the, as I went around the, the country and the world, I was so grateful to people how, they. They kind of conflated. Occupy Wall Street with Spider Man. It was like another New York thing. <laughs> it was, you know, it was, amazing people flying through the air. Uh, I, I, I really came to appreciate the uh, chutzpah of the project and all my life. I'm, I'm 61 now. I have a, a two-year-old baby. All my life, I will remember last fall, those, those amazing gatherings. You were all there? You, you all traveled to Zuccotti at some point in time? Hallelujah. Was it just amazing? Yeah. Just amazing? The, the lesson... Food was... Easy. Not a pizza, not a pizza. Outrageous food. Anniversary. Welcome home. <laughs> we felt right at home with, with our, our exploded American myth of the, the right wing, the right wing church. <laughs> the wrong wing. <laughs> the wrong wing of Christianity. Uh, we have we have preached uh, in Zuccotti Square just repeatedly. 
just every time we could get 10 or 15 singers together, we would go down there and wait, check, start, start the church service. We will now uh, have in us uh, a certain feeling about the power of living together in public. We will have, we will have a, a, a way of looking back from um, what it, the Occupy experience, looking back across the history of our of our ancestry of activists. We will see the hot plates. We will see the the poor person's uh, university in Union Square during the Depression when professors would come down from Columbia and so forth and teach free classes. We will see living together in public and we will see the power that that has. And we will not so easily be privatized. We will not let the walls go up. We will not let the false labels go up. Amen, praise be. We will not let ourselves be separated again. Let ourselves be with people that are much, much, much different than we are. And uh, let that collision take place. Let that uneven, unmemorized surface uh, play out the trust that you need to have there. As consumers, that's all commodified, and every, you know, the relationship we have with other people is solved for us by product delivery. Amen, praise be. We, we, we were free of that in, in, in Zakati Square for a while. Now it's this empty place surrounded by police. But it's hallowed ground. And I just like to go in there sometimes and just, uh, just, uh, I just like to go in there when it's completely empty and just preach to the police. Because uh, it will always have that power for me. Today I've been thinking about an upcoming meeting that will take place at the Waldorf Astoria by big bankers, um, wealthy entrepreneurs from China and India, big hedge fund people. They're moving large amounts of money into global ag, uh, paying local dictators and so forth to push the indigenous people away from land that is valuable precisely because those people, like the Ainuaks in, in, in Ethiopia, have the last really virgin forest in Eastern Africa, while well, they've been living with it yeah. sustainably for a million years. Now they're being pushed systematically, 200,000 have been pushed away into reservations, and then the bulldozers, and then the industrial agriculture. Uh, and of course, they're embracing the big lie, yeah. which takes place from consumerism, the big lie being that they're feeding the world. Yeah. Well, what they're doing is making a great deal of money with the specter of hunger hanging over us all as we, as we careen past the seven billion population. Uh, they are gathering now at the Waldorf. Now when Savitri and I and some of the members of the choir were in Nairobi five years ago at the World Social Forum, people were talking about that openly. They were saying, did you know that this lake in Africa is now surrounded by a private army. It's been sold. Oh. It's been sold. Water's becoming a commodity now. Yeah. They, they were way ahead of American radicals at that time. They were, well, I mean, you hear what I'm saying, yeah. ahead of the, the, yeah. the body of thought yeah. that we might have had at that time. Now I'm looking at them five years ago, sitting in some back room of, 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 of J.P. Morgan Chase, and thinking that by the time the American middle class radicals like you and me find out about this and get angry about it, because that takes another six months, by the time that happens, that five year lag time, we can set up a $70 billion market. We can be, we can, we, it can be moving. And at this point in Ethiopia alone, they've leased out an amount of acreage equal to Maryland. It, it's, it's, it's moving very fast and the army is just sweeping back and forth across that beleaguered country as children are uprooted, old people die too soon, and so forth. It, 
it is it is why I started preaching in, in, in 1997 in front of the Disney store, the sweatshop company yeah. in Times Square. It is it is the basis of so much of our liberal thinking, and it is the basis of so much of our of our left uh, our left uh, uh, political conscience. But here it's coming back, roaring back. It's like a tsunami. The scale of it. In other words, our our Occupy has just begun. We've just discovered a kind of power that we always had. It was right in front of us, living together. Pretty simple. Uh, but now that we know that, we have to apply this in in creative ways. I believe that in the coming months and years, uh, each and every person in this room will be called upon to step through a barrier of utter embarrassment. Is anybody here ready to, ready to really lose it? Can you be a fool? <laughs> Amen, praise be. Amen. Amen. I, I think we're going to have to lose our safety. Uh, the Anuak elders are saying through Human Rights Watch, uh, they are reaching out to us, they're talking to us. We should have met with them five years ago. We should have anticipated this five years ago and known this market was building. That lag time in which whole nations are changed, whole cultures are changed, generations of children are wiped out, diseases are managed, uh, ships go that way, that way, before we find out and finally inform each other and finally get angry and finally figure out what our slogans and signs are going to say. We have to do it another way. We're not, we're failing right now. We have to do it another way. Now they're going to meet on the 24th, Tuesday, April, in the Waldorf Astoria. You know, we're going to be there. We're going to be on the sidewalk with signs. We're going to, <laughs> we're going to post po protesters again. And, and we will be marginalized that way by our image, by what we do, by what we say, how we're identified, the way the journalists frame us. We got caught unawares. But, the, but, the, but there, is, there is, I believe, in this American spring, this American spring that is coming up right now, oh, I believe there's a kind of, there's a kind of politic, political action that's going to come into us that has the outrageous, beautiful creativity of living together. That, that, that creativity that we do so easily, you know, so playfully, so musically, sexy when we're around each other and living together. That whole new set of moods, that kind of symphony that we do, do, do with each other as people. How did that get divorced from our activism? How do we leave that at home and step out onto the sidewalk with a sign and start marching and doing chants? I know. I know from what I learned last fall that it will be an American spring. And Muhammad Bouazizi is easy in on us. The willingness to be fools. The willingness to die. The willingness to risk it all. As Americans, we've changed this culture that way. That's a part of living too. And we haven't been taking the risk when we go out there with signs and chants. We're rolling over and becoming sheep when we take that image. Let's just reject the old ways, the way the old vigils looked. Don't accept feeling good anymore. Don't feel good in the old ways, amen? amen. Let's be harder on ourselves now. Let's, let's write in our journals. Let's call each other. Let's be in touch. Let's say, I'm going to do this then. I'm going I'm to make the decision in this way. Run parallel with me. Let's write to each other. Let's, let's tell each other. Let's represent. Let's be confused and in the open. Do all the things we were raised not to do as educated people. We have to be creative now. And that's a... 
That's the miracle. That, that's, that's, that, that's what explodes in the middle of a good Bible story. Even for those of us who are, shall I say, post-religious. <laughs> We're making our own Bible story now. Last fall was, a, was some kind of special story. Let's live down here on this stupid little corporate concrete plaza in the shadow of Jamie Dimon and Blythe Masters and all the masters of the universe. And let's just let's just get out our hot plates and let's just start chopping celery here. And let's start feeding each other and let's start talking about the world. And let's make a decision together with our semaphore hand gestures. <laughs> let's start over. Start the culture over. Start the culture over. People were somersaulting a thousand miles away. A miracle. Let us pray. I ask the troubled maestro who directs we make up a new God every day in our church. Um, uh, the, the troubled maestro who directs uh, the circus of evolution. <laughs> We're just a bunch of tender souls here. We've been trying to do the right thing for a long time. We've gone through long periods of political exhaustion and a lack of creativity, but not, that's not the way we feel now. May each of us rise to our personal best in the American spring that is coming up. We have lives to save. We have the earth, I was going to say the earth to save, but that sounds anthropomorphic centric. Uh, <laughs> let's just ask the earth to save us. Yeah. Maybe we can find a way to make our way to the wisdom that the earth has already in us. Uh, oh! I forgot. Each and every one of us is made of the earth. Amen. Hallelujah. We've got it in us. And when we live together, these different earth entities start some kind of uncategorizable, playful, molecular dance between us, and then we, uh, some kind of evolution takes place. I, I'm, I'm discovering a, a, a biological political vision here, amen. Anybody read Jane Jacobs' last book before she died? She had a vision of government as biology, but government as animal bodies, plant bodies. Uh, where did this prayer go, anyway? Right off the cliff! <laughs> Amen, praise be. This American Spring. Let's just read a little Karl Marx. Read a little Jane Jacobs. Read a little Rachel Carson. And let's hold hands on the edge of that cliff. And then let's step into the air. And live. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Change the Change
a great Green Party candidate, and we appreciate it very much. We uh, know that the Green Party ideas uh, resonate because uh, there are Green Parties all over the world, and they're doing great, 90 countries all over the world. We have a situation in our country where we run great candidates, and they get very few votes, and people get discouraged. So I'm, my question is, uh, your, your reaction to that, what, what do we tell people when we want people to come out, run for the Green Party, vote for the Green Party, uh, sign our petitions, and, and they say, you know, we don't have a snowball's chance in, in hell. What, what is your feeling? Were you discouraged by the vote? I mean, you're, you're, you're a magnificent candidate and you didn't get that many votes. What is your reaction to that? What, what should we tell people? about that. And, and it's only in this country, you know, in Canada they just elected somebody to Parliament, in the UK difficult system just elected somebody to Parliament, but here we get 1-2% of the vote. So how, how do you address that? Well, I just want to be honest with you about my, my experience. Um, uh, I believe that what I learned and what the members of my community, the choir, uh, and the musicians, the activists, that were a group of 80 or 90 people, what the Stop Shopping community learned, um, what was manifest in, in uh, Zuccotti Square, uh, more than it was in, in the election itself, when Bill Thompson started pulling even with Bloomberg, I became afraid I didn't want to be the spoiler, and in the beginning of the evening I was the spoiler, and that's when I was getting drunk. Uh, but then uh, the Giuliani precincts of Outer Queens and Staten Island put Bloomberg over the top. Uh, and I know that my 9,000 votes, uh, I think there were indications that it was going to be more than that. Uh, but we really wanted Thompson to win. We thought Thompson was different than, than what he had exhibited in, in as a, a machine guy. Uh, he was saying some things in the in the in the course of the campaign uh, that that was far more independent. He sort of had a, a lot of space to operate in almost uh, a kind of Green Party luxury there because nobody believed he would win. So he had he had that that openness. Uh, the high point of the the high point of the campaign was preaching in, in the debate and stopping the debate. <laughs> and that first debate, and the uh, number of people that came to the YouTube was the exact number of people that voted for me, 9,000 people. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, I believe that... Uh, This is not the time for the Green Party to lose its nerve. Uh, we were overshadowed by a great man for a long time, Ralph Nader. Uh, and came to, we came to represent for a lot of people not uh, an unwillingness to accept the reality of the real politique of this of this culture, and then the long reign of, of George Bush hurt us a lot. Uh, we have to be realistic about what that was. But now that it's been a while, now we've had some time. I think I think there's I think that Occupy and the Arab Spring, uh, the WikiLeaks. Uh, I think that Bradley Manning. I think that. Those are changes in history, and those are continent-shifting experiences um, that make, make Ralph Nader really, really in the past to me. Anybody agree with that? That's what happened to me. Ralph went way in the past uh, with, with these recent developments. Um, looking back on it, on my campaign... Uh, another way to go might have been to uh, let go of this character and just 
wear the costume of politics, the dark blue suit and the red tie. <laughs> and, uh, you know, have my hair a little less Elvisy, and, and let my real name, which is William Talon, uh, be used. Uh, we decided to stick with the Reverend Billy character because we felt that, that I am more articulate with the character than I, than I am without it. Uh, uh, but I would right now not, not lose your nerve. Um, uh, but use Occupy as a way to connect with younger people with people of different cultures, people of different colors. Um, you know, you, 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 you really have to be in, you know, we, in, our, in our choir we have sort of a uh, Green Party problem. Uh, we, we, we want to sustain a 40% non-European level in the choir at all times because uh, the performance of Reverend Billy, I'm this big uh, uh, Elvis impersonator who takes on the toxicity of American culture, and I fail. And I need the people who are, live, come from all over the world, South Asians and Venezuelans and, 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 and Koreans and so forth, I need the immigrant world of New York to rise up and save me, basically. So that we, have, we have a one-two dramatic articulation that needs to have uh, diversity. The Green Party doesn't have nearly enough diversity. And you've got to you've got to be with these people and take the time. You get to be in St. Mary's at Harlem. That would be a place that, where you would be welcome. You you need you need to be all of America all the time. Special problem for you know uh, some people uh, living out in the suburbs. But I, you know the Ber Bergen County has a uh, and and Teaneck has a lot of diversity in 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 this place. Uh, uh, you have to be diverse on purpose. You have to do the work. It, you have to do the work. Because the, the institutional racism, the momentum of racism is, is something we all carry with us as white people. So you have to do the work. You have to tear that down. To spend the time with people. And, you know, we, we should be... Hey, Adam. How you doing? I'm almost done. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. You made me think of an otter. That's what I thought of when I saw you just now, not an otter. Has that ever been your totem animal? That's a new one. <laughs> I'm a minor psychic, but very minor psychic. Uh, so uh, that's a couple answers for you there, Steve, and you know, perhaps a longer answer than you wanted. I obviously have mixed feelings about my, my run. It was a nine-month thing. Uh, I raised and spent 50 grand. Well, we appreciate it. In a way, it was a uh, appreciation. One quick question, and then we have to bring Adam on. Okay. Leave. Yes, ma'am. I worry. I'm concerned about what you call that lag time in the water crisis. Right. Because that was predicted by Hollywood in the Jack Nicholson movie Chinatown, what, regardless that it happens in Ethiopia or. Los Angeles County, and you look at Carter predicted things in the 70s, so right. it's like when you say people to do their work, you got to really pay attention and act on it. So, I mean, I, I was concerned about it way back when, when I saw that movie, so do you have any suggestions for people around, you know, that? Well, I think that, I think that we have to give ourselves a break, people. We are... What's that uh, Paul Goodman uh, book, Growing Up Absurd? Uh, we have grown up absurd. Our mental environment, Callie Lassen's phrase, is, is absurd. We, we, we deal with thousands of advertising events every day. And some of, some of those of us who are more sophisticated think that we, that we can outflank those <laughs> bad puns and so forth. It, it changes us, and we end up sometimes upset about the wrong thing. I think through the George Bush era, we were often upset about the wrong thing. You know, we were, you know, he was exciting our liberal revulsion. <laughs> and, 
Uh, but it may be that the things that we need to concentrate on are fairly invisible to us right now. There's a psychological architecture around us uh, that, that we need to tear it down. And Zuccotti did that. Zuccotti changed the architecture. Old liberals would show up uh, and, and uh, you know, like press people with, and, and, and with their tablets and their, and they would just be confused because it was all happening in an organic mass of people. The divisions were not there. The, the separations were not there. The thing that makes us appreciate, say, gossip of a certain kind, or the thing that comes to us from the training of our minds by products can't, can't be overestimated. We have to relearn a kind of language that, for instance, the, the Anuaks in, in Ethiopia, sh their story should have swept through our culture. It was kept from us. We have to ask, ask ourselves, why? Why is it just arriving now? It may be too late. It's too late for many of them. Amen? Tough, huh? <laughs> Tough. We got to get the devil, children. Yeah. All right. Before we start, we wish you all the same dream. We'd like to give it a little token of our appreciation for the green party. Oh, that's so sweet of you. Amen. Praise be. It's so wonderful to have you here. And this is just a small token. Do you know anything about this? Not about it. I don't know what it is. It's organic. Tell them what it is. It's organic. Woo! Wow! Amen! Fair trade olive oil from Palestine. This is a wonderful gift. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.